Wish all of you all the graces of this Easter Sunday and this whole Easter Paschal time, which will extend all the way till Pentecost for 50 days. The epistle is taken for this Easter Sunday from St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, book 1, chapter 5. Brethren, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new paste, as, though, as you really are without leaven. For Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep festival, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. The Holy Gospel. From St. Mark, chapter 16. At that time, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices that they might go and anoint Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had just risen, and they were saying to one another, Who will roll the stone back from the entrance of the tomb for us? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back, for it was very large. But on entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a white robe, and they were amazed. And he, and he said to them, Do not be terrified. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, that he goes before you into Galilee, and you shall see him as he told you. Thus are the words of the Holy Gospel. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Today is the greatest event uh, of the whole church year. This is the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was brutally beaten to, beaten to the pulp at the, at the scourging of the pillar, crowned with thorns, and carried the cross to Calvary. And in a, in a condition that most men would die, most, even the toughest men would, would just drop because so much blood loss, so much uh, trauma to the whole body and to the nerves and then when our Lord was nailed to the cross, it is recorded and it's, it shows on the shroud of Turin that they, they nailed his right hand through the wrist, but the right, the left hand, they had to yank it with the chain that they arrested him with in Gethsemane. They took the chain and looped it around his wrist and yanked, violently yanked his arm, causing no bone to break. As, as the prophecy said, but it certainly dislocated his shoulder. And this is very painful. I've seen, I've seen people uh, in a condition where their shoulders are uh, dislocated. <clears throat> and sometimes it's extremely painful. And uh, they'll, they'll writhe in pain. So then they nailed the hand of our Lord right through the palm and they tied the hand because otherwise it would rip out. So, so that condition of hanging with a dislocated shoulder and in a position of suffocation for three hours on the cross. And then our Lord's seven great sermons from the cross, from right from the depths of his sacred heart, giving us his mother, teaching us to forgive all injuries as our Lord did. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And to fulfill God's will in all things, it is consummated, to thirst as our Lord thirsted <clears throat> for the glory of God and thirst for the salvation of our soul and thirst for the salvation of our neighbor's soul. And St. James says, he who converts one from a, a wicked way and converts them saves his own soul. And then our Lord intones as high priest and victim on the cross, he intones Psalm 21. My God, my God, why hast thou abandoned me? 
and the utter desolation in the heart of Jesus, the greatest suffering that we'll never comprehend. The physical suffering, which is already tremendous, just shows the horror of sin, but we'll never see the depth, how it wounded, how it how our Lord suffered in his sacred heart. And then uh, dying, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He roared. The lion of the tribe of Judah roared and delivered his soul. So first he bowed his head in obedience to his father and then delivered the soul. Most people die and then their head drops. But our Lord first lowers his head in obedience to his father And our Lord, being the the giant running the way, as he's called in Psalm 18, the giant who leaps down from heaven to the womb of the Virgin Mary, who accomplished the redemption on earth, dies on the cross. Now the giant jumps down to the limbo of the fathers, and he tears open, like Samson, he tears open the gates of limbo, and he steps in as king, as God. And all the, it must have been a tremendous scene, really. All the souls of all the billions, maybe billions, of saints of the Old Testament. So we're talking from Adam and Eve until the good thief. And that's, that's already, what, um, 4,000 years. 4,000 years of human history. So our Lord steps into limbo and... And as he promised the good thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. So limbo is not paradise. Limbo is not heaven. It's a place of natural happiness. They don't suffer, but they, it's certainly not paradise. <clears throat> but most of the fathers say when our Lord descended into limbo, he showed them his glory, his soul, which was divine. His body was in the tomb. They saw his glory And our Lord turned it into paradise by allowing all those saints to see the beatific vision so they could see the Blessed Trinity and the joy that our Lord brought um, in limbo to the fathers would have been indescribable joy because they've been waiting, some of them, hundreds and hundreds of years, Adam and Eve since the beginning, and Noah, and Rachel, Judith, Sarah, Abraham, The Maccabees, all these heroes of the Old Testament, known and unknown saints, they would have all rejoiced on on this day. And this was Good Friday at 3 o'clock. He descended there. So if we do a small calculation from looking at the Virgin Mary, because this Gospel says... The three women, the three Marys, went to the tomb on Easter morning at about 4.30 in the morning, right at the crack of dawn. But you notice who's missing. The Blessed Virgin Mary, she's not, she's not there to go anoint the body. Is she a careless mother? Is she a mother that doesn't care about anointing her own son's body? Far from it. The three Marys went because they lost the faith. But Our Lady never lost the faith. And she knew that it was useless to anoint his body because he would rise from the dead. She knew it. She never doubted. So her Catholic faith was solid and unshaken. The Blessed Virgin Mary. And this, she's, she's the refuge in our times when the faith is being so shaken with scandals from the Sea of Peter, scandals from bishops, scandals from priests, the loss of faith, preaching of heresy, and the formation of seminarians into modernism and heresy and evolution. And this this shakes the faith of many, even priests, even bishops, even nuns, who should be stronger in the faith, but even they are losing the faith. So where do we go when the, the storm hits, as it did on Good Friday, We go to the Virgin Mary. With her, the faith will be rock solid. With her, your faith is unshaken because we believe all the truths that God has revealed through his holy Roman Catholic Church that he promised will last to the end of the world and the gates of hell won't prevail. And we have a promise 
from Our Lady numerous times. That when the church seems completely decimated and the, it looks like the Catholic faith will have been extinguished, then she will step in. And then will the Catholic Church rise to a new splendor and glory, which will prove again the divinity of the Holy Roman Catholic Church that Christ instituted. It's not just a big, huge social club. It is divine, and it is holy. And the sacraments Christ gave are holy. So the Virgin Mary, <clears throat> if we could account the hours, she would have suffered from 9 p.m. on Holy Thursday, when about the Passion began, the, the, the sweating of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, and she knew it. She suffered everything with our Lord. If you calculate from 9 p.m. to 3 in the morning, Easter morning, that's 54 hours of intense, traumatic suffering for Our Lady. 54 hours with no food, probably very little drink, if any, and a heart speared through with seven swords. 54 hours. So, so Our Lady, she didn't go. She wasn't there to anoint the body because at three in the morning, Christ rose from the dead. And many of the saints and mystics say that our Lord, he shortened. It was supposed to be to Sunday later that he would rise from the dead. But he shortened the time for the sake of his beloved mother because she was suffering so much. Because remember, after Christ died and his heart was pierced on the cross, Christ's heart, he didn't feel it. But he gave out the rest of all his love for us, his water and blood out of his heart. But who felt that transfixion of the heart was the Blessed Virgin Mary. It was her heart that was pierced. And all the saints and fathers say she should have died. And there are mothers who die of sadness and sorrow. There, this is a fact. Sorrow can kill someone. And Our Lady, her sorrow, says St. Bernardine of Siena, if she parceled out to everybody on earth, equally, as, as many billions there are on earth right now, if she equally shared out the sorrow in everyone's heart, it would kill the human race. It would kill them all. That's the, the intensity of the sorrow that Our Lady had at the foot of the cross. So Our Lady, so crushed, on Easter morning at three in the morning, the, according to one of the saints, the angel Saint Gabriel came and filled her room with light and told her, your son is risen from the dead. And our Lord comes in with his, with his real body and he picks up our lady as picking up a, a, a lily that's been crushed to the ground after a hurricane. He picks her up and embraces our lady. A long embrace of the love of those two hearts of Jesus and Mary. And he revives her, so to speak. He revives, but she never lost the faith, but she still suffered really. And the joy that Our Lady went through would have, well, how can we possibly explain or describe the joy of the Blessed Virgin Mary? But the joy was so great. And never would she be plunged into such sorrow again. So let's look at a few details from the scriptures that confirm the bodily resurrection of our Lord. First, it talks about in St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, how Nicodemus went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded that the body should be delivered. So uh, Nicodemus, he was a saint, he boldly goes because if he was really poor, he would, Pilate would never give him his body. But Nicodemus was wealthy, he was well known, and he had a tomb. And he went to Pilate, which was very bold because he was one of the Sanhedrin, he was one of the high priests. But he converted. So he knew that doing this, giving honor to Christ and asking a proper burial for his body, 
was going to get him in big trouble. And in fact, um, the accounts say that they arrested him. They arrested Nicodemus later. And Christ, Christ came and released him from prison. So this is what St. John Chrysostom says. The boldness of, of, Joseph, of, of Nic- Joseph of Arimathea is highly to be admired when for love of Christ he incurred peril of death and exposed himself to general hatred. So Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. And then he asked the body of Jesus. He asked for the body of Jesus. But, but how did he ask? This is, this is what St. Anselm says. And St. Anselm says this was revealed to him by the mother of God. That his words were from Joseph of Arimathea going to Pilate. His holy, he's, this is what he said to Pilate. His holy mother is innocent. And the matter is serious and urgent, for her only son was crucified. It is therefore contrary to reason that the innocent mother should die as well as the son. And it would be some consolation to her to bury him. Grant to the mother, therefore, most afflicted as she is, this favor. So it was, it was through Our Lady, uh, having compassion on Our Lady, that Pilate actually did consent. And Pilate was fed up with all this, and he, he let Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus uh, take the body of Jesus and bury him. And then in the scripture, it says, you, sometimes there are details that you wonder why they're there, but here they are. Verse 60, St. Matthew chapter 27, and they laid it in his, his new monument, his own new monument, his tomb, which he had <clears throat> which he had hewed out in rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the monument and went his way. And St. John says, chapter 19, Now there was in the place where he was crucified a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, wherein no man yet had been laid. Therefore, there, because of the perceive of the Jews, they laid Jesus because the sepulchre was near at hand. So the distance was not that far from where Christ was crucified to the tomb of, of Joseph of Arimathea. It wasn't that far. And in fact, there's a church now built on it, which is from one transept to the other. It's, it's only a matter of <clears throat> a couple hundred feet. But why does it say in a rock? This is what St. Jerome and St. Bede say. For if, if it had been built of many stones and the foundations had fallen in, it might have been said that the body had been stolen away. So it's an it's important detail that it's a solid rock. It's one huge rock. So there's no small rocks to dig out and say, well, they stole the body. So these details are actually very important. And then St. Bede, commenting on St. Mark chapter 15, describes fully the form of, of Christ's sepulcher. This is St. Bede the Venerable from England. Those who in our era came from Jerusalem to Britain report about the Lord's tomb, that it was a round enclosure, cut out of the underlying rock and so high that a man standing inside could hardly touch the top with his hand extended. Its entrance was on the east against which the large stone was rolled. In the northern part of the monument, the sepulcher itself was the place where the Lord's body was placed. Made of the same stone, seven feet long and raised up a distance of three palms above the rest of the floor. This place was open, not from above, but from the southern side where the body was carried in. So again, another detail that is very important, that the rock was, it was a solid rock tomb. And then, of course, the guards. The guards are placed on, to guard the tomb. And this is verse 63 of St. Matthew chapter 27. They come to Pilate. And here's what these rats say. These are the Jews now. That saying, Sir, we have remembered that that seducer, 
said that while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. So they call Christ a seducer. They mock him. And, and even in his death, they still hate him. So uh, talk about kicking a man down when he's down. They've killed and crucified Christ, and they're still not done with him. And now they put guards on the tomb. Command, therefore, the sepulchre to be guarded until the third day, lest perhaps his disciples come and steal him away and say to the people he has risen from the dead, and the last error shall be worse than the first. So St. John Chrysostom says this, wishing to prove that he was an imposter, even before that they extend and continue their malice even to the grave. So Pilate then says, Pilate saith to them, you have a guard, go guard it as you know. So, verse 66, and they departing, made the sepulchre sure, closed off, sealing the stone and setting guards. So the details of the seal, in Greek, the word seal means they sealed it with a signet ring, not Pilate's, as St. John Chrysostom suggests but with their own ring, with the signet of the city of Jerusalem, or with the ring of their supreme council, which was called the Sanhedrin, so that the stone could not be moved from the tomb, nor the body be taken away, without its being detected by the breaking of the seal. So when Daniel was put in the, the lion's den, the king sealed it with his ring. So this was kind of a prophecy of our Lord, who would rise out of the tomb unharmed from corruption and, and, and putrefaction, because our Lord's holy body would not see corruption, as Daniel in the lion's den would not be torn up and be food for the lions. So Daniel rose out of the lion's den alive and healthy and smiling, and he was actually fed by an angel. The prophet Habakkuk was carried by his hair uh, about, about 300 miles away, carried on his big bushy hair for miles and then dropped into the cave of the lion's den. And Daniel, seeing this, uh, they praised Almighty God because that was the way God fed him. So God takes care of every little detail, even little Daniel in the lion's den. So Daniel coming out with the seal unbroken is a prefiguring of Christ rising out of the tomb Without breaking, uh, without breaking the seal from from without. So Saint John Chrysostom says this: a certain proof of the res of, of the resurrection of Christ is furnished by your own doings. For if the sepulchre were sealed, no room was left for fraud and deceit. But if no fraud had been committed, yet the tomb was found empty, it is clear without a doubt and beyond all question that he had risen. You see how, even against their will, the Jews helped to demonstrate the truth. St. Jerome says it was not enough for the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees to have crucified the Lord unless they guarded the tomb, took a band of soldiers, sealed the stone, and as far as they could, opposed his resurrection, so that all they did was for the furtherance of our faith. For the more it is kept back, the more fully is the power of the resurrection displayed. So on top of that, they have the seal. They've got bolts into the tomb, into the rock, and there's metal chains and bands around the tomb. So perfect for our Lord to show his great divinity. And that's what happens at three in the morning <clears throat> When our Lord rises, the, 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 the soldiers are there. Now, I've never found any of the fathers of the church who say how many soldiers were there. Some suppose even up to 100. Some suppose maybe 30 or 20. The guards, Roman guards at the tomb. And they were paid by the Jews. And so imagine the Roman guards who are saying, okay, we'll take the pay, but we're guarding a dead body? But the Jews actually paid for the first witnesses of the resurrection. And these guards are not going to stay, they're not going to stay quiet. They're going to get extra pay to keep it quiet, but they're not going to stay quiet. 
they're going to talk about it. And it's going to go through the bars and taverns and the word's going to get out. So what happened that morning was our Lord's body is cold. It's cold stiff at about 5 to 3 in the morning. It's, it's cold stiff. It's wrapped in the shroud. Our Lord comes back from limbo. It's 3 in the morning, Easter Sunday. This day, the first Easter Sunday. Our Lord's soul enters into his body miraculously. The rejoining of the soul and body. And he who is master of life and death, he will raise his life up again. And, and then the details, it'll be interesting to know all the medical details, how this happened in heaven. But all the wounds of our Lord, his blood supply, his heart starts pumping, his eyelids, his body gets warm, and all the wounds of Christ are completely miraculously cured. So if Christ can cure lepers at a touch, he can cure the leprosy of all his wounds and bruises and, and deep gouges. And then all the, uh, all the wounds of his head from the crowning of thorns, his swollen cheek, his busted nose without breaking the bone, but swollen and bent nose, his swollen eyes, his black eyes, all that is completely cured. His feet, all he keeps are the trophies of his passion the wounds in his hands and feet and his side. These he still has in his resurrected body right now in heaven. And they, they shine, those wounds shine to the refreshment and joy of all the saints and angels, to the glory of the Father. So our Lord then, the, a bright light emits from his body and it's so bright the, the, that those who study the shroud say it was, it was so powerful and bright but it didn't burn the cloth. So it was a miraculous light that should have burnt the cloth with the energy behind it. It should have burnt the shroud. But it didn't burn the shroud, but it, it impressed the image of Christ through the shroud so that his body passed through it. And that's why St. John, when he ran to the tomb this on the first Easter morning with St. Peter, <clears throat> They come to the tomb and St. John, Peter goes in first and St. John sees, uh, follows Peter and he sees, because he was there to lay the body of Jesus and anoint it and wrap it. That's when he immediately falls to his knees and said, he is risen. Because the, the, the cloth is still there as, as if he passed through the cloth. It wasn't in a position of getting out of bed and you move the sheets and you jump out. <clears throat> but it was the body passing through the cloth and all wrapped up. So when St. John saw this, he immediately recovered the faith. He's the first of the apostles to recover the Catholic faith and admit the truth that Christ rose from the dead. So Christ's body really passed through the shroud and it captures all the wounds of Christ before he's healed miraculously at the resurrection. So it captures all the sufferings of Christ as a, as a reminder to us of the great love of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. So in this shroud, they pick up even the coins of Pontius Pilate that were pounded in his time, only under the reign of Pontius Pilate. And those images of the coins that they put under the eyelids of our Lord to keep his eyes shut as a dead body, uh, those, those coins shine through. The markings are on the shroud. And another proof of, if it's, of its authenticity. Plus they find uh, many flowers around Christ's body. They find the nails and the, some of the thorns that, were, that show up in the shroud. And of course all the pollen of flowers that only bloom only in Palestine during spring. March, April. Pollen from that time. And pollen never rots or corrupts. So... Uh, another outstanding confirmation of its, of its truth and authenticity. So the shroud of Christ shows his divine face, swollen and beaten. So our Lord's body passed through that, and then his whole, his whole body was miraculously restored. He rose from the dead, and he's the first to rise from the dead and stay alive. Because remember, the prophets in the Old Testament raised some people from the dead 
but they died again. Lazarus was raised by Christ from the dead, but he died again. Christ is the first to rise from the dead and never die again. And so he appears, so, so in the tomb, a huge light emits out of the tomb, and Christ passes through the rock by the gift of subtlety as he passed through the walls of the upper room. And this is a, this is a little glimpse of the joys of heaven with your resurrected body. You'll be able to walk through walls. You'll be able to walk through mountains. You'll be able to walk through trees, if there are trees, whatever it is in, new, in the new earth. You'll be able to walk through it. You won't need airplanes. You won't need trains. You won't need cars. You just fly. So it's a little insight of the glory of heaven. And so our Lord, then the angel comes. Now, now there's a tremendous earthquake. The guards are all alerted at the tomb. And this is where they become witnesses. Because the angel comes and throws the rock down like a golf ball. Just picks it up, a huge, huge stone, rolls it and sits on it. And as many of the fathers of the church say, he sat on the rock and the soldiers saw his glory of the angel. And they felt the earthquake and they were terrified, so terrified that the scripture goes into detail that they were terrified as if dead, paralyzed with fear. And these are big, tough Roman soldiers who are used to doing night watches. So, you know, imagine being in a cemetery and the body comes to life. This is kind of <laughs> their... their uh, what they're going through. And they see the power and glory of this angel. And he sits on the rock as if to say, I'm quoting the fathers, bring it on, go ahead and attack me. And if you do, I will crush you like fleas. And the guards, they have no doubt about that because the angel is powerful and glorious. So the guards then, after all is back to quiet, that's when the, the three Marys are on their way, and they witness all this at the dawn, and Mary Magdalene stays at the tomb. The other two go back, and that's when our, lady, our Lord will appear to Mary Magdalene. She becomes the apostle to the apostles. She becomes the first to see Christ after Our Lady, and she's the first to tell the apostles that he rose from the dead. And that's when St. John and St. Peter go sprinting back to the tomb. So... And then, on this beautiful morning, the, the earthquake <clears throat> is felt all over Jerusalem. And the earthquake of Good Friday shook the entire earth. The whole earth felt it. But on Easter morning, there was another earthquake, and it woke up all of Jerusalem. And then the guards go back to the Jews and say, they just say, we can't explain it. The tomb is empty. He's not there. Just give us our pay. I think he rose, he rose from the dead. There's no other explanation. And some of the guards are convinced. By this time, some of those guards are already converted. And some of them will be baptized by the apostles. And one of them, Longinus, will become a saint and even a bishop and die a martyr for the Holy Catholic faith. So what happens? The Jews say, look, we're going to pay you extra money. Don't spread the word that you saw him rise from the dead. Don't, don't spread that word that you saw the tomb empty. Because remember, it's solid rock. There's no way the apostles could dig out and take the body from... Plus, the apostles were dead scared. That's another detail. There's, they didn't have to fear the apostles because they were like mice hiding from the Jews. They were dead scared. They would never have tried to take the body because they were really scared. And it took our Lord to come and, and appear to them, forgive them for their apostasies, running away from him, strengthen them, and, and, and turn them into lions at Pentecost, from mice to lions. So the, guard, the guards are told by the Jews, we'll pay you extra money, just shut up. But the guards, they take the money, but they don't shut up. They spread the word. And then, of course, our Lord appears five times on Easter Sunday to, at five different occasions, at five far different places, such as Emmaus, seven miles away. And then, 
And then our Lord will appear many times after. And our St. Paul says he appeared at one time to 500 disciples, 500 souls, 500 people at once that Christ came and probably walked among them and they could see his wounds. So this is the fact that we adore, that our Jesus Christ the King was truly dead, truly was, had rigor mortis, was truly buried in a rock tomb. He truly rose from the dead. He truly established Peter as head of his Holy Roman Catholic Church. He gave us the love of his sacred heart in the seven sacraments. He gave us the Catholic doctrine, which we don't have the right to change. And a pope and bishop and priest do not have the right to change our Catholic faith. They cannot say, for example, that now the Catholic Church the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church, as if to say it can also subsist in the Protestant Church and the Anglican Church and the Mormon Church. And that's, a, that's such a heresy. It is a, it's an attack on the very foundations of the Catholic Church. So a Vatican II has unleashed all the guns against the foundations of the Church, against Christ's divinity, against his kingship. And this is where we have to stand strong and immovable like our Blessed Mother, as Archbishop Lefebvre stood as well and, and professed the Holy Catholic faith. And not just profess it with our lips, but love our Lord with all our heart. And let it flow out with the good odor of Christ, as the sweet odor of Christ. Let it flow in good works. Always good works. Be greedy to do good works. And don't forget, good works is not just feeding the poor or helping our neighbor are burying the dead. Of course, the funeral homes do that now, and they're highly paid to do a work of mercy. Uh, it's not just the physical works, but remember the hidden works of mercy that are so pleasing to God, which are to pray for our, our neighbor, the living and the dead, to pray for the souls in purgatory, and to instruct the ignorant, to people who might ask about the Catholic faith, or ask you whatever, lead them to our Lord. Lead them. Give the reason for the hope that is in you, says St. Peter. So these are the hidden works of mercy. And then uh, to love our Lord with all our heart, with all our strength, with all our mind. This is a great grace we have to pray for. So let's turn to the Virgin Mary, who was immovable and strong in the faith. And on this resurrection day, on Easter Sunday, the apostles gathered around Our Lady after they saw our Lord they ran to her, and, and she smiled because she never doubted he would rise from the dead. She never doubted. But they all called her mother. The apostles had a great love and devotion to the Virgin Mary. So, so different from how the Protestants treat the apostles as if Our Lady was insignificant. And that's not true. She was truly mother, and she would be their mother and be with them in all their apostolic Labors. She would even appear to St. James while she was still alive. She would bilocate to St. James in Spain and tell them, don't leave these people, convert them, S stay with this, this uh, barbarian people because Spain will render a huge harvest for my son. So let's glorify our Lord, let's adore him. And, and again, I say this again and again and again, we aren't Protestants that just read about Jesus' resurrection and oh how nice it was and how great it must have been to be there. We're not Protestants and Quakers. We're not Mormons. We're not pagans. We believe what Christ handed down. And one of the treasures he handed down was to command the Catholic priesthood, the priest, to say those very words that Christ said at the first Mass and make our Lord present, his sacrifice is present, and the living God, the resurrected Christ, is also fully present on the altar after the consecration. So you will be able to touch our Lord in his wounds and say, my Lord and my God, because you will really receive the living God. You will be united to the burning heart of Jesus, who is truly glorified in the Holy Eucharist. This is the love of the sacred heart. And this is what we want Protestants and Mormons and Buddhists and all of them to come to realize. This is the love of the Sacred Heart. You can receive Him and be closely united to Him 
And he burns off the rust of sin, burns off purgatory time, increases all the grace in your soul, increases the love of God, increases the fire of the faith, because he's the burning fire, the heart of Jesus, that inflames us. It's him. It's not words. It's not wind. It's himself in the sacred transubstantiation at the consecration, the changing of this bread and wine into his very body, blood, soul, and divinity. So we can truly fall to our knees like St. Thomas and with the apostles and the Virgin Mary and embrace Jesus Christ the King. And he's, it's actually him that embraces us and carries us in Holy Communion. As he told St. Augustine, my son Augustine, when you receive me in Communion, it's not you who carry me. It's I who carry you. And this is the love of our Good Shepherd. <clears throat> may he carry you and may you uh, be a docile lamb and not kick him and uh, bite his ears and drool on him. May you be a good lamb to be conformed to his will to be carried into the joys of heaven. Which joy I wish for you, all of you through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. And for those who do not have recourse to thee, especially all communists and Freemasons, and other enemies of Holy Mother Church. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.